Welcome back to the conference and the last afternoon session. So there is a small change in the program. Uh, in order to have a marathon session after the break, we will do the break that was forecasted just after Jean Laurent's talk. We'll do it after the presentation of the World Inequality Lab. Okay, so we're going to have two presentations first, the break, and then two presentations. So uh, that's the a small change. Uh, without further ado, let me leave the floor to Jean Laurent Rosenthal from Caltech. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to start with some. Um, Brief thanks. Uh, I've been coming to this site since 1988 to work with Gilles Postelvinet. Um, this all started in 1987 while I was working on my thesis, and Gilles came to Pasadena. Um, and I explained to him what my thesis was, and he didn't say anything, so I deduced it. He probably didn't think there was much there. So luckily, he forgave me for that error. And then we started working on credit, um, and we have just finished with Phil Hoffman, who is studiously doing some data entry on the fifth floor, uh, three books. And I'm going to talk about a separate project that began uh, in 2001 after Joseph uh, Kitty published uh, his book on income inequality in France. And Gilles and I had some questions about the 19th century. And remember going to see Thomas and Thomas saying, there's no data. So this is an answer that economic historians give you when there is no data. It has also been an occasion for me to learn a lot about the dynamics of inequality in a very empirical setting, a very specific setting, Paris. And so when I come to Paris, I come here, and both in the days of the Léa and the Delta, and since the Paris School has been founded, it doesn't matter when I show up, there will always be a desk. There will always be people to have conversations, and what makes a great institution are the intellectual conversations we have when we are there. And so thank you. So, um, Bien de Rentier, Paris, 1842-1952. Um, so this is extremely preliminary work with Thomas and Gilles. Um, and so let me try to give you some context if this thing will happen. Okay, so it's an initial effort to reconstruct. Initially, when we started around 2001, what we were trying to do is reconstruct the wealth distribution for France based on data for Paris, because reconstructing the wealth distribution for France would be too difficult. Fifteen years later, we have 30 cross-sections of wealth at death for Paris between 1807 and 1962. And the reason why it's 1807 and 1962 is because in the 1960s, there was a lady called Adeline Domar who hand-collected 1847. So Gilles and I decided that we would actually try to see if we could reproduce what she did. So we collected 1847. Then we started by saying, well, we'll do once every 10 years. So that's 1837, 27, 1807, going forward in the sevens. Then we decided that wasn't a high enough frequency, so you know, you're not very smart. Figured it out five years before is the twos. So we collect the sevens and the twos. Um, today's problem is, is slightly different. It's, what I'll show you is that in the 19th century, Parisian inequality was high, and it worsened over time. <coughs> At the time, a very small but visible population lived largely from inherited wealth. We're going to call them the rentiers. Then there was a great reversal. Private wealth at death in Paris collapsed. And at the same time, rentiers as a social class pretty much disappeared. So this paper is about why and when. So this is the data set we've collected. So around 1800, about uh, 11,000 adults die in Paris in any given year. Um, and in the early days, we get data that allows us, allows us to get anybody who has wealth at death. Uh, then in 1902, uh, um, there's the beginning of proportional estate taxation. And at that point, you'll see our, our numbers start to fall because we, we can't collect quite as many. What happens here is the initial records don't provide the wealth data. You have to go directly to the declarations. The blues, we, we have the full data set, but it's not very detailed. We just know real and movable wealth. The purples, we've stratified a sample where we collect a, a full data set on wealth for the top 2%. Then we have the sampling rate and double the scale. So from the next 4%, we only get half. The next 8%, we only get a quarter and so forth because there are more and more people. Okay? So we finished collecting in 1957. But because I happen to have other activities in life, including being the dean of a, of an, of a part of Caltech, it's been collected, it's partially processed, but I have to wait for the summer to finish cleaning it up. 
and we're almost finished uh, uh, with 1962. And after that, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that the archives, well, actually the Ministry of Finance started throwing out records, we're going to stop. It also turns out that what we're measuring here is the fiscal definition of wealth, not the economic definition of wealth. Before 1914, there's not much of an issue. The interwar period is not so bad, but after the 1960s, the differences between the fiscal definition and the economic definition of wealth gets worse, both because there's a lower threshold at which you have to pay and because certain kinds of assets don't pay, which means they're not perfectly recorded. Motivations. Uh, so, as I said, reconstruct the initial distribution of, of wealth of France using Parisian data because there's no data. Uh, definitions. So, what we observe at death are the number of people who die in Paris. We have a fair amount of detail on that. But then, to show up in our data on wealth, you have to be wealthy. But you have to leave something. And the French have a definition of the estate tax that's very specific. It's on the first franc. So it doesn't matter how large your estate is, you're supposed to file. And we, we can say something about what that means. So if you have a financial account, whether it's at a savings bank, with a broker, or at a bank, you cannot transfer that if there isn't an estate tax filing. So we're very good with people with financial assets. We're very good with people with real assets because, again, you cannot transfer the property without filing an estate tax record, even if the liability is low. Where we are bad is the junks that's in your house. If you ever happen to die living with your children, this, the state tax administration is not too concerned in figuring out what's in your armoire or under your bed. Okay? Um, on the other hand, we have a fair amount of cash and gold and other kinds of stuff that would be very easy to evade if people were trying to evade the tax. Okay? So uh, we'll come back to that. The second group, so the wealthier are those, the contrast to poor have zero wealth. We also have a group of people that are a subset of the first one that are called inheritors, which is individuals whose estate includes personal property rather than just community property. For those of you who are not French and do not come from a civil law country, that distinction may be a little bizarre. So the French define marriage in a very specific way. It's a partnership. Assets that are inherited by either party remain the assets of, these indivi of the individual. Those are personal assets. Second, if your parents are nice to you, and when you get married, you inherit, they give you a dowry in cash, that becomes a personal zero interest loan to the community. It's again a personal asset. The first, when the first partner of the marriage dies, the partnership has to be dissolved. So we get a record of both the cash transfers from the personal wealth into the community, as well as all the assets that remain that were inherited by that individual. And we also get a record of all the personal trans uh, cash transfers from the other party. What we don't observe is the personal assets of the person that survives, because they're not part of the estate. Okay? So we do know for people who die married, what fraction of them inherited something, sometimes a lot. Third group is a group we defined in a paper uh, uh, we finished a couple years ago, are rentiers. And this is not the definition I'm going to want to use. I'm sorry, we usurped a word that it, in, in, in retrospect we shouldn't have used. They're inheritors whose bequest is less than the capital value of the wealth they inherited. Okay? So to be clear, these are individuals who when they die, leave something behind that they could have constituted strictly out of what they inherited and the capital earnings from that. Okay? So think about this. You inherit a house, 30 years later you die, and the value of your estate is, is that house plus some other stuff, but that stuff is equal to the rents net of the maintenance of that house. You're a rentier from our point of view because you got to consume your entire labor income and still leave the bequest you left. Okay? So it's a notion of people, the rent, that first definition of rentier is people who do not save out of labor income. Okay? The rentiers I want to talk about today really come from social history, and they're a subset of the rentiers above because they also have to be quite rich. They're the people who show up in Marcel Proust. Um, so if you want to, we could stop here, go read Marcel Proust, it'll take you the whole of the afternoon, and we'll be done. Uh, some details about these three groups. So the first thing is, this is the part about wealth inequality in Paris. So you, you read it from the bottom up. The bottom part is the top one-tenth of one percent well share in Paris at death. Okay, about 20% if you have to tell your parents about that. The next 
nine tenths of one percent get you to about half of all the wealth in Paris and about 65 percent at peak, which is uh, in the decade before World War I. Okay? So Paris is extremely concentrated in terms of wealth. This is true of most large cities. This is not a characteristic of Paris that's exceptional. There, there are other things that make Paris exceptional. The next 4% um, are of the dark gray bit. And then you notice that by then we're at somewhere near 90% for most of this period. There is some wealth below between the 80 and 95th percentile. But essentially one of the reasons we're able to do this is for most of the period we're dealing with, people die with no wealth. Sort of almost 75% of everyone dies with no wealth. People come to Paris to consume. Maybe they come to Paris to accumulate human capital. But at the time, they largely came to Paris to consume. And you could see at the tail end, the little dark vertical bars at the end. You could think about those two upper categories are kind of like middle class wealth at that. Okay? And for Paris, at least, it's an invention of the 20th century. But remember, and this is something we're going to have to, to, to keep in mind, is that wealth accumulation is a lifelong process. So when we start seeing things at death, you should think about this started happening 30 years before. It's a long process to build that wealth up. So cross-sections reflect stuff that's happened in the past. This is another version of what's going on in Paris. So these are uh, particular wealth levels for fractiles. Uh, so the top one is the, the uh, 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 real intel of wealth for the person that's at the bottom, the top one-tenth of one percent. Um, and you'll notice that roughly their wealth is multiplied by six and a half over the course of the 19th century. But what I want to attract your attention to is the fact that in, in the 1950s, their real wealth isn't very different from where we started. This is the full revolution of private wealth in France. And although if you actually do the numbers, the growth rate here is not quite as impressive. The decline is also that way. And this is the P95. Again, looks flatter, but that's just purely on a, uh, on a visual scale. You get this very rapid growth of wealth to before World War I and a very rapid decline. Um, and the decline is more severe at the top uh, than it is uh, at the bottom. But we're actually interested in trying to understand where this comes from. Okay? Last part of the sort of background issue is, remember I told you there were these people who inherited wealth and we wanted to figure out what kinds of individuals are such that they can constitute their bequest without, consuming, without saving out of labor income? Okay? Most of us in this room will have, if we want to have a bequest or actually a retirement, have to save out of labor income. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So first, that group is small. In Paris, it's never more than 10% of the population. It's also an incredibly stable proportion of the depression of the people who die. Okay? What's weird about this is, in particular in this period, the, 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 the group is very different over time, but as a proportion of the total population, it's relatively constant. Its share of wealth is somewhere around 60 65%. And then, uh, starting in the 1920s, it starts to decline with an abrupt break during World War II. And you can add to that share of wealth, which is this is a share of wealth held by rentiers at death. The share of wealth, that difference is a share of wealth held by non-rentiers that they inherited themselves. Because there are people who are not rentiers who inherit, right? So you inherit 1,000 francs, and you leave in a state of a million, you're going to have to save out of something else. Because there's no way you can capitalize 100 francs or 1,000 francs into a million francs. So that's that piece. So, but what I want to emphasize here is there is a suspicion you should start having that there is a form of wealth that doesn't look like life cycle savings. People who inherit large amounts of estate tend to leave large estates. Okay? So we're going to think about something called dynastic arithmetic in which people aren't life cycle savers. They're saving with a goal of transmitting wealth through the generations. Okay? I'm not saying that's the only thing that goes on in the world, but we think that's an important dynamic for wealth. So um, the flow return to capital is what we're going to call R. Capital income is going to be RW. We're going to define about labor income as YLA, and we're going to use that as our deflator. Because if you're really rich, what you actually consume is labor, servants, and other kinds of individuals. Okay? It's a very different kind of activity, and you tend to consume a lot of bes bespoke goods, which are, again, going to have a very high rate of labor input. This growth at the great growth G 
So the change in the cost of labor is just, uh, just going to be uh, uh, increased by G. And so if our inheritor saves G over R uh, times this is uh, now cap RW is capital income, then his wealth next time grows at the same rate as the cost of labor. And if he continues to do this, and, oops, sorry. So his, he wants his wealth to grow at the rate that the cost of labor rose because if the rate of return is constant, then the amount of capital income that he has remains constant in years of labor. So if he has 12 servants, he can continue to pay the 12 servants over time. Okay? If he doesn't save at all, at some point, he consumes too much and he's going to become poor. He's going to have to fire his servants. Or he, can't, he cannot also have the house in Normandy and the uh, apartment on the Côte d'Azur. Or he cannot go uh, 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 take his vacations in Nepal uh, or the Seychelles. So you want to think about this, that the program has to be, I want to be able to reproduce my standard of living over time, and I have to do this out of capital income. Okay? And so consumption is essentially just, in this case, a residual. I save essentially the growth, I, I save out of, my, out of my capital income enough to reproduce my wealth, at the, to let my wealth grow at the same rate as uh, the cost of my goods. And so if you don't like YLA, you can put some other version of a consumer basket for the very rich, and you'll have the same issue. So you save essentially GWT, and you consume R minus GWT. You can include capital gains, and you get the same thing. And if this works, the rentiers persist forever. Okay? I want to emphasize this because you're going to see some pictures that are going to look a little jumpy. It's not because I did this while I was on the plane. There's lots of turbulence. It's because if you do this and capital income is variable, right? So if capital income doubles, your consumption doubles. If you're doing consumption as a residual of your savings program, you're going to get a lot of variability. Okay? So just bear in mind that this program is bad, so you can also solve for constant consumption over lifetime equivalents. Okay? Now to go back to Xavier's talk, this is something that's really difficult to implement because you need to know the future returns for 30 years. So I am going to tell Xavier, we're not going to do this. We're going to allow people to be behavioral in this way and use a very simple form formula for doing this that approximates this for a long period of time. Okay? So what we do is we take our data that's wealth at death, and we're going to assume for now, because it's not a bad approximation, that every estate is inherited by one person. In practice, every person actually inherits two halves of estates, a half of their parents' estate and a half of their mother's estate, because on average, people have two children. Okay? For now, we'll, we'll leave that problem aside. And so for each cohort, what we're going to do is we're just going to allow that cohort to save 25% of capital income, let wealth grow, convert the 75% of capital income into consumption, and that gives you these profiles. So each of these lines is one year of wealth at death, and we pick, as a representative agent, the median individual in the top 1%. Okay? That's our representative agent. And so you could see that over the course of the 19th century, with some bumps, roughly speaking, these people can enjoy 50 years of labor income, okay? which is somewhere north of a million euros a year. For those of you who are interested in what your consumption possibilities, if you were in that group today. Then, then you, know, you notice that there's this bump because, uh, for whatever reason, rates of return in the 80s are relatively high. Then there's a decline. There's a rapid run-up uh, before, uh, before World War I that we still want to work on because we're not sure this is real. Uh, um, and then there is a decline during World War I. Then you, you could see the 1920s, which were the period that in the U.S. we call the Roaring Twenties. Capital returns were extremely high. Now, some of this might have been illusory because you know that the Great Depression happened later. But for those of us who've lived in California, when there are bubbles, people really consume. They go out and they buy Ferraris and other kinds of Italian vehicles. They blow up their houses to add an extra story. This is, this is some of what we see here. Okay? And then you can notice that there's also a regime change because, in fact, the cohorts are stacked in inverse year of death. The, the later you, you die, the poorer you are. Okay? So this is the oldest cohort, next oldest, da 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 da, da. So there's something going on with initial wealth levels uh, affecting how wealthy you are. And you'll notice that for the cohorts that die after World War II, one simple approximation is they never consume anywhere close to what the cohorts that died 
that I had inherited before World War II ever did. There's a regime change that happens uh, in World War I, and then uh, the Great Depression and World War II bring you down, and then you'll notice that now we're down at levels of consumption that are much lower than they were before. Okay? This is all without any taxes. This is what you could have done if you had saved 25% of labor income and you didn't pay any taxes, which is okay. So we can aggregate those up. We can then, again, because after all, uh, we are economists, and so we like to know what people would do if they got it right. So uh, the dash line that you can see there actually turns out to be the perfect foresight line. Uh, the problem is we decided that we would also try, actually, uh, an adaptive expectations version, which is use the last 15 years of data to figure out what your current savings rate should be. And that turns out to produce really bad results in years that are very choppy. Yes? So, sorry, just for expectations. So that picture shows both uh, so the, uh, the inherited, inherited wealth uh, evolution, also, but also the income distribution. So some part of that is, of course... There's no distribution. Money. This is... This, you can think about it. I could have given you five lines of this for different individuals. But how much is driven by the evolution of labor income or like average labor income and how much is, if you, if you think about some other consumption good uh, consumed by the rich. So how much is driven by just the evolution of wage so earners? We're gonna, so can you hold that one? Because I, I, right now you could think about it is that what we have is actually a relative return to capital versus a relative rate of growth of the cost of labor as the, the one thing that's driving this, plus initial wealth levels that are falling as well. I will give you a, more of an answer when I get to the tax side, okay? But right now, if you want to think about the economic innovations are all buried in one thing, and we are working on generating an independent series for, uh, if you'd like, the cost of living or some version of that, and an independent series on returns. Because right now they're coming out of national income accounts, which makes things a little complicated because when you raise returns, you, to capital, you have to lower returns to labor, uh, and that raises consumption both ways. You have more capital income, and labor is cheaper. If I lower capital returns, I make labor more expensive, and I want to have some independence there. So that's the part that, of the paper that's really not finished. Um, the application don't work. So problems with constant savings rate is, if you save out of labor income like most of us do, and you're lucky enough to be a university professor, which is because you're employed on a regular basis, then you're as long as you have every year positive labor savings, savings out of labor income, then your consumption is relatively smooth. But if you're only saving out of capital income, and in particular a proportion of capital income, when capital income is moving around like crazy, your consumption is moving around like crazy. Okay, so this is, if you're very risk loving, the program I showed you before is okay. If you're risk averse, it's a very undesirable program. Okay, so an alternative is to compute constant uh, consumption programs, so that depends on information about future return. It makes some sense to look at the perfect foresight in the 25 savings consumption consumption. So if you want to know where 25% constant consumption, that's a reasonable approximation to maintain your wealth for the 19th century. Even though it's variable from decade to decade, over the long term, 25%, you do really well. So if you were going to use a heuristic about the past, in the pre-inflation, pre-World War I regime, 25% would have been a pretty good shot. Okay? So these are consumption equivalent to perfect foresight savings rate and average consumption. So average consumption, I just average the consumption over the 30 years that you live. Just find out what that is. And the constant consumption equivalent is, what's a constant consumption program that allows me to leave an estate that leaves the next year, my child who has the same consumption program, the same level of consumption, okay? And so generally, the constant consumption programs above the average consumption program, the simple reason is with average savings, you have to save a fair amount in, 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 in periods where returns are low and your consumption is low. In really good years, you don't save enough. So you consume like crazy. But the average of this, because of the exponential process, is bad. So you'd rather actually save a lot in years where capital returns are high and actually possibly even dis-save in periods where capital returns are low. Okay? So, but again, you get this, this path that sort of starts around 50, rises before World War I, and then collapses during these period, but remember, read these as every dot, and then you're going 30 years out, which is when these people are experiencing. They start at the dot, and they go 30 years forward, okay? Um, 
So capital income clearly falls dramatically relative to labor costs. Next time is trying to pack the taxes. Uh, this is something we can measure by applying the appropriate schedules for estate and income taxes. Prior to 1870, this is essentially irrelevant. Taxes are low. Starting between 1870 and 1900, there's a variety of different fiscal innovations. The first one being the impôt sur le revenu des valeurs mobilières, which is a, one of the rare taxes that are taken, uh, not, that are not paid by the individual, but are paid by the issuing institutions. Right? Le prélèvement à la source began in 1873. It just didn't diffuse through all the other taxes. Um, after 1900, taxes rise and are revised frequently. In 1901, they put in an estate tax schedule that's progressive, and the income tax is 1915. We thought the estate tax was a dumb tax, and they wouldn't move it around very much. Well, it actually turns out you actually, they change it a lot. Okay? So there's 15 estate tax schedules between, uh, uh, or 14 estate tax schedules between 1901 and 1952. There are annual revisions to the income tax schedule, in particular, strange things about what you do with numbers of children, lots of other kinds of things like that that we have to worry about. Um, it's very nice now that the Journal Officiel is online because uh, you never quite know where these things are going to come up. Okay? Last part before we move on to what we do, Paris estate taxes is not an estate tax, it's an inheritance tax. So the American estate tax, you, you pay nothing until you hit the threshold, and for a long time you paid half of your estate if you were above the threshold. Okay? So you didn't pay anything on the first million dollars, you didn't pay half on everything else. That's an estate tax. And it doesn't matter who gets the money, as long as Christophe is not a charitable organization, at which point he gets all the money, we don't pay the estate tax. In the French case, going back to the beginning, it's always been an inheritance tax, so the liability is borne by the inheritor, and how much they pay depends on what their relationship is to the deceased. So you, children pay very little, the Paris School of Economics would have paid 15% in 1901 because, of course, as a charitable organization, you, don't, you, you need to contribute to the, to the coffers of the state. Okay? And as taxes rise in the interim period, what's been interesting to us is this effort to preserve the patrimonial or the direct descendant estate is severe. So if you go and read the estate tax records and you look at the highest marginal rates, sometimes it's 50%, sometimes it's 60%. But Nicolas Sarkozy did not invent the bouclier fiscal. There's a general rule that children in direct line of descent cannot pay more than 25% average tax. So that's what binds. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, as economic historians, we worry about. Income tax is, a, is, 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 uh, is even more complicated. And so we adopted essentially a rule that was adjust, the, make the estate tax, pay the estates, given what we know about who the heirs were. If you have three children, divide the estate into three thirds. Let them pay. That's the tax bill for that estate. And then we do this totally crazy thing, which is we reconstitute the estate and give it to one person. Okay? And we do this and for every single estate. In the absence of being able to link our estates across different individuals and cohorts, there's no other way out of this process of trying to simulate what an estate might be. Okay? And I want to emphasize that there's a huge distinction between having the 20% cross-section and the full population of estates. We don't know when you inherited from your uncles and your aunts, but it's clearly not the same year as your father or your mother died, and your mother and your father are not going to die in the same year. So we cannot really constitute what are bona fide inherited estates. We know what, the, what you leave behind, but we don't know what inheritances are as well as we would like. So these are the tax schedules over time by fractal. Okay, so as I said, very low, uh, a little bit more than the minimum 1% at the beginning, because of all these people who leave estates to people who are not their children who pay higher rates, okay? And um, if you look at this with a, 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 a magnifying glass, you'll notice that the highest fractals don't pay the highest tax because the highest fractals are the most likely to have children. So they get a little less of this process of giving to other people. Then you'll notice that taxes really just explode after the beginning of World War I, and you'll notice that the uh, uh, average tax rates right here um, so when you look at this, you probably start thinking, oh, now we have an explanation for why wealth started to decline. The state started to take 20% and then a third of all the value of wealth. Okay? And we did have to pay for World War I. Uh, but that's actually not quite right. Uh, the black line is the average cohort consumption without taxes, and the dashed line is average cohort, cohort consumption. The state tax is put in. And the reason is... The state taxes are paid roughly once every 30 years. 
So it takes 30 years before you treat the whole population. It's a trivial, it's, after the fact, it's totally obvious. It's just not going to have a big impact until you're down here where it does, but it doesn't look like it's having a big impact because proportionally the estates are so much smaller. But here the estates are proportionally 30% smaller. So it does have a bite, but it takes a long time. So you put in something severe around 1920, you fully treat people in 1950. Okay? Very slow to diffuse. So if you want to actually sort of think about fiscal policy, estate taxation may get you a lot, but you have to be really patient um, because most people are not going to pay it now. They're going to pay it over the, as, as they move along. And, and, and so the dashed line is the average estate tax rate uh, for that group. Uh, income taxes look similar, except the process begins earlier. Why? Because even during World War I, the French government needs money. It needs it now. And estate tax is a really bad way to get money now unless you can confiscate the whole estates. Because only 3.5% of the population, roughly speaking, is going to leave their estates now. So income is much, much more rapid. The rates are high, and they rise essentially pretty much throughout. Um, and these are computed with what we think are the right uh, lower bound exceptions and a bunch of other stuff. They're still pretty severe, but you'll notice that for relatively low levels of income on capital, uh, tax rates aren't so bad. So here you could see the effect. So first, the bump of the 1920s is completely erased by taxation. Okay? So the, the wealth recovery from the 1920s is just gone. Okay? So you stabilize at, at what happens at the end of World War II, and then after that, you can't see the difference, but there is a big difference between the top line over here, which is uh, without tax, and this bottom line where you pay the whole thing. Uh, that's a very substantial chunk uh, of, of income. And so there's a real transfer of capital income from private hands into the government. Okay? Um, this is, this is core consumption. It, it's the same picture, except now I've averaged the consumption and all the starting point are, again, the years in which people inherit. And so you could think about these lines as there's these sort of strange lines going out. And you can also see, again, how uh, income taxes essentially damp down the recovery after uh, uh, World War I. Uh, and then, again, at the end, how essentially taxes, in some broad sense, take away roughly half of the consumption possibilities of uh, the very wealthy. Um, so to go back to Daniel's question about how much of is what is what, okay, uh, we're going to do two different things. We're going to imagine what kind of estates individuals would have left if they had consumed as they could after taxes and saved all the rest. So we're going to essentially say that these are people who aren't just dynasts. In a sense, I want my children to be like me. Because my goal is have my children be like my parents. Okay, so I'm living in the 20s and the 30s, and I remember what it was like when my parents had 50 years' worth of labor income. So I'm going to save like crazy to try to reconstitute the familial wealth. Okay? So that's one story. And then the other one is we're going to assume that he, so we're going to go full dynast. People in 1842, they know the future. What could they do? So you can think about that. That's not the problem of an individual. That's the problem of the foundation of PSU. We want to think about having consumption possibilities not just now, but in 100 years. Okay? Now, the problem for PSO, hopefully, is that they don't have to pay income and estate taxes, but our people will as a dynasty. Okay? So this is the first counterfactual, and it's a little tricky to interpret. Uh, so the dashed line and the, the bottom, uh, so this dashed line is the one you saw before. This is what would have happened at 25% savings uh, uh, without taxes. This is... Uh, uh, what we think the consumption possibilities were with taxes. And then, what we, and, and then we add this last line, which is uh, a little difficult to interpret because it should actually be 30 years further. It's if these people choose this but don't pay taxes, what would their children's consumption possibilities look like? Okay? It's a bit of a goofy counterfactual. In the absence of taxes, had the rentiers of the post-World War II period consumed at the rate that they did after taxes, it would have taken two generations to recover the consumption possibilities of the pre-World I period. Because essentially their consumption possibilities 
triple between here and there. And if you triple it again, you get back, this is five, that gets you to 15. Another three times will get you to 45, which is pretty much where you want to be, okay? But they can't do that, of course, because they have to pay the taxes. Uh, so that's one way of thinking about the impact of taxes. The impact of taxes essentially makes it impossible to ever go back to the world you had before. This is another way of thinking about this process. So you just start with the 1842 cohort, and you tell it, look, World War I is going to happen. They're going to put in these taxes. They're going to do this other thing, and you want to equalize consumption forever. So there actually turns out to be a program that equalizes consumption forever at 38 years of labor income. But of course, what they have to do during the 19th century is just save like crazy. Because World War I is coming, and they're going to get taxed. And of course, it's almost like a sort of kind of useless race because as you save more, you get taxed, you, you move up in the tax brackets, but they can do it. How, how severe is this savings program? This wealth here isn't the wealth of the person in the median of the 1%, it's the wealth of the person in the median of the top one tenth of 1%. So you move one order of magnitude up into the wealth distribution. It's not a huge change in, in, in savings. Um, it's, it's moving from about 25% savings to, to around 40% savings, but it is non-trivial. And then you could see as, as time goes by and as they start paying these taxes, uh, they end back up down there. Uh, uh, other things, uh, so this is the actual inherited wealth profile. Uh, this is what they do if they don't adjust. They just say, hey, you know, happy days. We were consuming, I'm not, I'm not closing down the chateau. I am not getting rid of the maître d'hôtel. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna consume. Uh, it doesn't matter Mom, how too much what you do, and I think this goes to, back to Daniel's issue. There doesn't seem to be a huge sensitivity between 1924 and 1928 as to when they run out of money. Um, if I choose a slightly higher rate of return in the 20s, I can, I can get them to 1928. I have never been able to get them to 1930. Okay? So there was an adjustment that was severe. And this is something which, again, is the interaction between different issues. So one of the things I've been interested in is in World War I, large numbers of men die. Not a lot of women die. So did you keep the women servants, but did you just not replace the men? Is this the adjustment? Which is, again, a form of, it's not an optimal thing, but it's a reasonable thing for somebody to do, right? You don't want to look like if you've had these people working for you for a long time, but as the men are brought into military service, you don't replace them. So that may have been most of the adjustment, but this is something we're going to actually try to investigate, okay? And then there is an optimal adjustment if you knew what was going to happen after here, so you just lived happily doing what you were doing before, and then you realize the war and everything else is going to happen, you save a little bit, and then you start accumulating wealth in preparation for World War II, but it doesn't do you much good because World War II is really, really bad. Okay? So to close, ranchers die because of a combination of low relative capital returns to, labor, to, to the growth of labor costs, and I think it doesn't really matter what we use as a, as, as, as a deflator. Uh, and high taxes, the range for taxes is between one-third and one-half of decline, the rest from shocks. Now, um, how much of that in the shocks is destructions versus, uh, so uh, your capital returns from any investment you made in northeastern France had to be low during World War I and part of the 1920s, first because during the war that happened to be occupied by Germany, and after the war because you had to rebuild it because the Germans really understood depreciation really well. Um, so you could think about those kinds of things, but we can't tell at this point. We do have all the micro data of what these portfolios look like, so we will be able to deal with some of that, but then it becomes very an individual specific issue. That is, we're gonna get a lot of variance around these results out of, building the port, out of building portfolios. The Russian default, is that a destruction or a low capital returns, right? We'll have to think about this. The other thing that's important is all of these people own really large numbers of government debt in 1912. It's a 3% nominal return. Inflation during World War I is high and it's just literally eroding, it's just eating their wealth over time, okay? So some of that we'll be able to deal with, but it's complicated. Most of the transfers from rich individual, not just the very rich, to the state. Thus, inequality in wealth doesn't change as much as wealth. I want to also emphasize is even within Paris, this process is reducing inequality at the income level because there's huge numbers of people who have no wealth income because they don't have any wealth. So, but on the other hand, I don't know what economic models suggest that an economy 
if it really had 10% of the wealth that it had in 1912, in 1952 would be as prosperous. Okay? So there is an issue about uh, how we deal with that, but that's something we, we, we can't deal with this. At the same time, to go back to where we started with and why the rentier as a class, as a group of people who uh, have relatively high levels of inherited wealth, remain stable, is there's an increase of a number of individuals who leave some wealth behind. Because one of the things that's something we still don't have a good an answer for why this happens is starting in the 1880s as pensions diffuse, what we observed then 30 years later, so starting around 1905, is individuals who, who die, we see their pension because the part of the pension that wasn't paid between the last time it was paid and the day they died is an asset to the estate. These individuals also tend to have other financial assets. Okay? So uh, we do see those in the estates of their children 30 years later, and they become rentier if they didn't accumulate a lot of wealth. So there is a weird issue, but these people are different from the people we've been talking about today because those smaller rentiers live largely on labor income. Okay? So uh, that's kind of where I want to leave it. As I said, it's, it's very much ongoing. Um, this is the only way we could do this is by accumulating data. And I just want to remind all of you that when you get old and can't do theory as much, you can always go collect some data. And the one thing that's really amazing about France is for the last 200 years, we have a set of archival records that are unparalleled in most places. So if you're interested in interaction between economics and policy over the long term, this is one of the best laboratories that you will ever find. Much better than most of what you can get out of the US or other countries because you have a state that likes to know stuff. And that's what we depend on. Thank you. How does the, your rentiers differ from the leisure class? So, uh, oh, so this is something that we're probably not going to do in this paper unless we want to turn it into, you know, um, a lot of them have retirement income. We can see that. A lot of them have other ways in which in the estate, so these people we know a lot about them, are, uh, have been at some function in a business or something like that. So we do know more about this. We haven't classified them. The, the, the problem, and, and, and I think other people have worked on other kinds of data, is what do you do about women? So the women of the 99.5 don't usually report an occupation. Okay? Uh, and, and so for men, it's pretty clear that, that un, until some age, for those that die somewhat young, you know, there is administrator of this company, they're the director of that company. They're the ambassador at this place. They're the gouverneur de la Martinique. Uh, but he shows up in 1902 because if you remember, the Martinique blew up in 1902 and he happened to be a resident of Paris. So we see him. So they are not idle. It's just that whatever you could imagine their labor income could be, most of their consumption possibilities are coming out of capital. It's not, I don't want to suggest that they're idle. It's just, it's just a completely different level of issue, okay? Um, and, and can you investigate the role of the role inflation plays in the Yeah, so we can net out. Uh, so th there's a picture I didn't want to show because how many of these things you want to see is, is, is limited. Uh, where we did it real versus nominal, that doesn't make much of a difference. That's a different question from saying there's this average. Uh, and the reason why I didn't want to do it that way is because it's really complicated to reset all of the estate, <coughs> all the tax. Uh, brackets, real. And that just introduces a lot of measurement error. Uh, but there's, there has to be some way we can evaluate independently the effect of the average inflation versus these relative things. But at that point, I think it's probably better to break out the assets between uh, bonds, which in particular for the 20s are overwhelmingly older bonds that are very fixed income, and we should be able to see something there, versus, say, uh, French equities, which would be less subject to that. Okay. So what their, their portfolio look like? Is it land? Is it financial asset? 20% uh, over this long period of time, more or less, in real estate. Um, like farm or, or property? Chateau? Or? Well, no, I mean, if you have enough, you have the chateau and the farms. Okay. <laughs> you have the Hotel Particulier and five other buildings in Paris. Okay. 
So uh, we, can distinguish between the we can distinguish between these things. Uh, the pavillon on Seine-et-Marne we can is reported as a pavillon on Seine-et-Marne. So for real estate, we have a lot of stuff because we were concerned about Paris versus not Paris, and they tend to say an hotel particulier rue blank or something like that. But we've but the other thing is uh, this goes back to something I asked Martin. The cost of this information is high, so we have not collected the detail of every bond. So we know that it's a rente française, but we don't know whether it was issued in 1900 or 1907, because at that point, we will collect fewer people, and that's the trade-off we have to make. So 20% real estate, and my memory is the bond versus stock portfolio is pretty balanced. Then there's a bunch of other stuff, like uh, retirement pensions, cash, uh, dowries, uh, uh, um, yeah. Um, the real estate is low in Paris, and it's particularly true for the top 1% will have a relatively large real estate. If you go below that, before uh, 1920, they essentially don't have any real estate unless they have some stuff because they're migrant and they've inherited something where they came from. Because Paris real estate is owned building by building until the 1920s. Um, and almost everybody's a renter, uh, which has some other issues. Yeah. Jean-Laurent, could, could you try to have two kinds of uh, wealthy people uh, in the 1850 or 60? One of them is owning uh, 100 or 200 of hectares in uh, Seine-et-Marne or some nice place with it. And the other is, buy, it is buying shares of Air Liquide, where Air Liquide was founded. I don't remember when, but later, later yeah, 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 but a long time ago, you know, perhaps. Uh, in, look, some, some French industrial companies set up before the First World War, you know, so I was, I was thinking in reality, I mean, it couldn't be really... Schneider. That'll work. It's the right period for you. So, so we, so some of, some of the way this historical project has occurred, initially, so the estate tax records have come in two volumes. One which is a list of names. So every time somebody dies, they, they add the name the date of death and some information about address. And then they wait. It's, it's, it's like a, a, a fish that waits for prey to come by, which is for somebody to come in and declare some wealth. And before 1870, they report movable and real wealth for individuals. So we have that piece before 1870. After 1870, those records just give you the dates at which people came to declare their estate taxes. So we have to collect that. This is not my question. No, no but let me get back. You, you so me, this is somebody who perhaps didn't exist, but it's just to check that what you are measuring is the rate of return of people who might have been smart or not smart, either or not either. And so, so it's an average. What I would like to see is whether some standard guy who own land and some other guy who own industrial equity, you know, after 120 years, whether there is difference or not, or whether it's because they were holding government bonds and then you got war, inflation, taxes, or okay. whatever. So uh, we, we have to be actually very modest on that one, yeah. Because we only see, we don't link people. What we have pretty good now bond and equity return series because Pierre Cyril Ocar has been putting this data together. And we have been matching the asset prices and dividend flows for the specific assets that are in our data. Okay? That is a small part of the portfolio. So to go back to your question, about half of all of the equities that is in the data is not publicly traded. Not even not publicly traded, possibly in London or Brussels or Amsterdam, just not publicly traded, okay? Including some very big firms. So that's a problem because you have to assign a rate of return to that stuff. Real estate is tricky. We don't have the greatest real estate return series. We'd like to have one for stuff outside Paris and one in Paris. So some of this is sort of as you start developing the project, you start realizing you need new data. And, you know, we've been talking since I came here about putting together a wage series of people who might have been employed by rich people. And my proposition, Gilles not yet fully convinced, but I, I have two more days to go, uh, is Les Archives des Hôpitaux de Paris, because somebody who is an infirmière or a garçon de salle looks pretty good to me as a domestic. And that data exists. It just has to be collected. There are problems with it, but the question is, every, as you do this, right, the next question, you reconstitute the wealth, you start thinking about its dynamics, then you start worrying about these return series. 
And that's in some sense where we're at now. I think we should. Thank you.